Good afternoon, everyone. We'll be starting shortly. Um, let's just wait for a few more people to join in. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon again, everyone. Um, and thank you so much for joining this webinar today. I'd like to take this time to welcome everybody who was able to, to join in. Um, we have these uh, webinars weekly and um, unfortunately due to unforeseen circumstances, we haven't been able to, to have them in the past two weeks, but we are back and we are looking forward to, to a lot more um, webinars to come. So today we will be having um, a webinar on vac COVID-19 vaccines and vaccination. We have um, a presenter all the way from Lesotho who I'll introduce shortly, who will take us through um, the different vaccines that are currently there. Um, that have been approved so far, um, how they work, the types, um, their efficacy and safety, the major side effects, as well as um, their use in relation to the, the variants of concern. So just a few housekeeping um, issues before we start. This webinar series is co-organized by the Ministry of Health, the University of Botswana, um, Botswana Harvard Partnership, as well as the Rutgers University. Um, please do join our mailing list so that you are able to get um, invitations um, to these webinars every week. That's the email that you can email to so that you are added to the mailing list. These sessions are all over Zoom and we would um, really appreciate for you to keep your mics muted um, if any question pops up, you can just quickly um, write it in the chat um, 
use the chat function there and the moderators will respond to it. Where they can't uh, be able to respond to it, it will be addressed by the presenter at the end of the presentation. This session is recorded as well as other previous sessions have been recorded. And um, there's a feedback survey that will be emailed to you and we'll really appreciate your input into how we can improve our sessions and what other sessions that you'd like to be a part of in the future. So this is our YouTube page, um, the Botswana Rutgers Partnership for Health. Like I mentioned, this um, webinar is recorded um, and previous other ones have been recorded. So as you can see there, we have different topics um, around epidemiology, patient management, contact tracing, critical care. So if you are interested in any of those topics and many other, you can just go um, and visit that page. You'll be able to get access to those. And then um, of particular importance here is the document library, which you can find um, through that URL for covid19portal.gov.bw. So within the document library, you will be able to access all the different guidelines that have been um, prepared so far in relation to COVID-19. So um, we have several guidelines, guidelines in relation to pediatrics, to uh, pregnancy, isolation, um, clinical management, um, as well as other infection and prevention control um, guidelines. If you just go to that URL, you'll be able to get um, access to those guidelines. So, um, Today, like I mentioned, we'll be delving into the topic of COVID-19 vaccines and vaccinations. We have um, the pleasure of having Dr. Francis Mupeta, who is an infectious disease um, specialist and a WHO a consultant currently based in Lesotho. So he's a graduate of a joint training program with the University of Zambia and the University of Maryland in USA with a double major in Masters of Medicine in Internal Medicine and Infectious Disease. Um, he's currently the WHO consultant for the Lesotho Country Office for the COVID-19 response. And prior to this, he worked for the WHO in Eswatini and has also worked um, in the African Regional Office, supporting 15 African countries during the outbreak of the COVID-19, during the COVID-19 pandemic. He carries a wealth of experience in public health and disease control, healthcare management, strategic planning, budgeting, as well as project management. Prior to his employment at WHO, he served as the infectious disease unit, as the head of infectious disease unit um, at the University of Zambia, um, as well as the honor, honor, honorary lecturer, excuse me, at, um, my tongue is running away, at both the University of Zambia and um, Lusaka Apex Medical School. So I'd like to take this time to welcome you, Dr. Mupeta. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Dr. Smith, for having me. And uh, thank you very much, colleagues, as well. Okay, yeah, so thank you very much. And uh, we shall be talking about COVID-19 uh, vaccines and then we'll start with the immune response. Please, next slide. Uh, these are WHO uh, standardized um, um, reference material. And then there's also some of the uh, materials that are my own and also um, from um, the clinical care options. Next slide. Okay, so this is how the global situation looks like. We have had over 241 million cases with over 4.9 million uh, deaths. Uh, we can clearly see from the graph there that there have been uh, uh, three distinct waves 
you know, having, uh, you know, various uh, types of, uh, you know, um, impact in different regions of WHO. We can see that Africa, uh, you know, is ranking last in terms of the number of cases, although we know that uh, the issues with Africa is, uh, you know, um, um, records rather than really having had uh, you know, escaped the pandemic. So um, yeah, this is how the global picture looks like as of today. Next slide. So from the WHO dashboard, uh, we learned that Botswana has had over 184,000 cases and uh, with over 2,339 deaths, if, if I'm not mistaken. Should be, it should be more, I think, on this one, I'm not mistaken. But this is from the WHO um, website. So it could be correct or it could be more, uh, I stand to be corrected. Next. Uh, when we look at the world map, we will see, um, you know, the vaccination rates as of today. So uh, the darker the green, the higher the number of people have been vaccinated. So you see that uh, typically the southern of Africa, except South Africa, uh, most of, uh, you know, uh, countries are in between 10 to 19 people being vaccinated. And, and, and uh, we can see that um, it's quite low vaccination rates compared to the rest of the world, the Americas. Uh, you know, um, Europe, uh, Asia, uh, including uh, the Russian Federation. So um, Africa is still trading behind as well. Uh, why this is so very difficult, uh, you know, to answer. Next slide. Uh, this is as well as we stand today from WHO data about over 600,000 doses have been administered in Botswana, giving us at least 26.93 doses per 100 population. And then we started vaccinating as of 26th March. Next. All right, so now I'm sure we all know this guy and how deadly he was when it came to boxing. And you know, every time that you are fighting Mike Dyson, you know, people had to spend over three months in the gym training, you know, for, for the big bout. And uh, despite that training, you'll find that Mike Dyson will knock them out within the first, you know, a few seconds of the first round. And, and that's boxing. Now, next slide, what, what we understand by a vaccine, what is a vaccine? Next slide, please. So a vaccine uh, really is a substance that mimics a particular infection, which is inoculated into the body in order to provoke an immune response. So it's not really an infection, but it's a mimic. It's an imitation of a real infection. And the, and the reason why we do that, uh, you know, it's to train the body, like you are training to make Mike Tyson to ensure that it doesn't knock you out in the first round. You'll have to train more and more, just like, you know, the other uh, boxers were able to knock him out. So that's basically what a vaccine does. It trains our bodies to prepare for the actual fight when an infection comes in. How do vaccines work? Next slide. So, you know, vaccines are like, you know, soldiers. So we've seen starting from, you know, Genghis Khan, you know, in Mongolia, if we come to the Vikings in Europe, and next slide, if we come to the modern day, you know, soldiers, they all work in the same, uh, you know, way, which is to protect the integrity of a territory, you know, and, 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 and this is what our soldiers do. And basically in the body, we've also got soldiers that protect the integrity or the health of our body. And that's basically what, uh, you know, vaccines do. It's to ensure that they train these soldiers well in advance, just like soldiers go for military training, that's what vaccines do to train the body to fight, you know, a particular infection. Next slide. So um, vaccines work at, you know, um, trying to, um, um, In the immune cells, which are found in the body, in certain areas 
in the lymphoid tissues. So basically, if we were to use the analogy of soldiers, we've got the soldiers who are basically residing in certain barracks. So this lymphoid tissue are basically the barracks where they are trained, equipped, and then when there's really war, the soldiers from the barracks are unleashed, and basically this is what happens with the immune system and the lymphoid tissue. All right, next slide. So what happens when there is a viral infection? Uh, the immunity responds in uh, you know, different ways. There are basically two the innate immunity and the adaptative immunity. The innate immunity is uh, non-specific. It's something that is uh, we are born with and it responds the same way to every infection. So if you bring this type of infection, if it's supposed to slap, it's going to slap instead of punching as it is in a boxing match. So it responds the same way. It doesn't differentiate between the two infections. And then when we come to adaptative, like the name is suggests, it's adapted to a particular infection. So it is specific for that particular infection. At, and it involves you know, two types of responses. The first one is the cellular response, which basically is just the response of the T cells of the immune system. And then the second one is the humoral response or the antibody response. So basically this involves the production of antibodies which come from the B cells. So you can actually see that using the graph down there, uh, when somebody gets infected, you know, there's a period between uh, the time of infection to the time when somebody develops infection, that period is called an incubation period. Now, during this incubation period, the body is not just sitting idle, there is actually an immune response. So the first immune response uh, is the innate immune response, which is not specific, like we said, and then it's there for a few days and then uh, goes down in the second week. Now, the, 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 the other one is where you have got now the virus, the, the innate immunity is not capable of defeating, uh, you know, the viral response, especially certain viruses. So you actually see this second line graph, which picks as the viral load. Now, as the viral load picks, normally this is the time when symptoms develop and symptoms are developing because of the immune response. So the first, uh, you know, um, immune response, <laughs> Uh, is is uh, the net like I said? Then comes now the um, the cellular response and the humoral response. Basically, the IgM, which uh, is the first one, and goes down eventually. And then later on, you've got uh, the cellular uh, immunity, which is also responsible for um, producing the antibodies. Uh, the IgG, which becomes you know more or less like prolonged and sustained, and can be detected long gone after uh, long after the infection is gone. So basically, this are some of the dynamics of what happens when you get infected from incubation period symptoms and then immune response uh, in the body. Next slide. So now, when it comes to a person who is immunized, there is a difference from one who is not immunized. Uh, most of the times, as you saw, that the immune response is a bit delayed. Now, in an immunized person, this is one who is already trained to respond to that infection. So the response by the body is faster and is even more robust compared to one who is not. So what you have are the immune memory cells because after you are exposed or you are vaccinated, the body retains the memory. And once you are re-exposed to that infection, you actually see that the antibodies will quickly uh, you know, the response will be faster because there should be some antibodies which are already circulating and then some of them are manufactured as the cellular response, you know, takes place. So you can actually see that this person who is vaccinated after being infected, the graph down there, which is in blue, is the viral load. So you see that the viral would, the viral load would just go slightly up because there's already a robust cellular response and the antibody response as well, which takes care of this infection within a matter of days, which is very different. Uh, if we can just go a slide behind, 
you can see that in an, uh, an, an vaccinated person being exposed to the infection, you can see that the viral load goes very high there in the, in the blue and peaks there. So you can actually see because of these, you have got somebody you know, experiencing worse symptoms and even the severity of the disease are different than in a person who has been vaccinated. Uh, forward slide. So after, when you are vaccinated, your immune response is ready for that infection and it's able to take care of the viral particles much easily and faster, thereby reducing uh, you know, the chances of one being symptomatic or even having severity of symptoms. Four slides. Next slide and another one. Yeah, so thank you very much. So um, uh, no, the previous one, yeah. So basically this is just talking about the immune response which is induced by vaccines. So most vaccines deliver, uh, you know, an immunogen, which is basically just a protein, and and this immunogen could be the whole virus, part of the virus, uh, or just a part of the instructions for the virus, like the genetic material, to actually, you know, uh, provoke a, a certain type of immune response. So it could be the cellular response or the human response, which produces the antibodies. And then the antibodies basically are there to neutralize the specific virus, whereas the cellular uh, immunity is there to recognize and also destroy that um, you know, vi virus infected cell. Next slide. Okay, yeah. So in COVID-19, we've got different types of immunogens which have been used to make the COVID-19 vaccines. And that's why we don't have just one type of vaccine because different types have been used. Like I said, uh, the first immunogen is inactivated virus. So this is where you've got the entire virus, but has been rendered you know, powerless or weak uh, uh, you know, in as far as infection is concerned. Then the next one is the viral subunit. So instead of getting uh, you know, um, uh, the whole virus, but just part of the virus is actually uh, you know, taken as an immunogen. And most of the times this is a protein uh, that is produced by the virus, which is actually made into a vaccine. The next one is a viral vector. So viral vector are relatively new types of vaccines where you get part of the uh, genetic material and implant it into another virus that uh, is relatively innate or rarely cause disease in, in humans. And then this virus will be able to enter the body. Uh, itself doesn't cause infection, but the genetic material it's carrying is that of that highly infectious, uh, you know, um, virus. Then the other one is the RNA vaccines where you get part of the genetic material and make an immunogen. So some of the um, examples of these inactivated, um, uh, is, sorry, there the, the, the are pros and cons for each of these type of vaccines. And we need to know and what sort of vaccines have already been used. So inactivated virus, uh, the advantage is that it induces a strong antibody response and you need to have antibody, lots of them to neutralize any virus. The disadvantage is that it requires a large quantity of virus to, you know, um, to be, uh, you know, manufactured. And then these viruses rarely actually uh, produce cellular response. So the antibody response part of the immunity is good, but the cellular response is weak. Some of the vaccines that we already know on the market are influenza vaccines, which are given you know, um, in, in the Western country, almost on a yearly basis, rabies, hepatitis A and polio. Then a viral subunit is where you derive a protein pathogen from this. The advantage is that it has got fewer side effects because it's not the entire virus, but just part of it. And most Hello, Dr. Mupeta. Doc? No. We seem to be 
be having a problem with network on your side, unless it's it's my network. Can you hear me, Dr. Mpet? Oh, it seems we have lost Dr. Mopeta. Please do bear with us while he, he tries to reconnect. Okay, Dr. Mupeta is working on um, reconnecting. Um, if there are any questions that are coming up uh, from what he's presented so far, please do um, write them in the chat. The moderators will be monitoring them. If um, we are able to respond to them, we'll respond to some of them, but um, those that we are able to, they will be responded to by the presenter. Please do bear with us for a few minutes. Okay, Dr. Mupeta has been able to rejoin. Dr. Mupeta, is the network okay now? Okay, I'm back. Uh, sorry for those okay. that think uh, the dual car once in a while, uh, the internet is not so stable. Yeah, so yeah, um, yeah. I was on the viral vector. I hope that's where I ended on the viral vectors. Um, yeah, so the viral vector vaccines. Uh, this is, like I said, you just take part of, uh, you know, um, the um, genetic material from the virus of particular interest, and then you put it on another virus, which is innate. Uh, the good part with this is that there is rapid development, and then they also elicit a strong cellular response as well as um, an antibody response. Now, the disadvantage is that prior exposure to vector viruses like adenoviruses may reduce the immunogenicity, all right? And then some of um, they will require uh, boosting, and then some of them can uh, actually result in um, very severe side effects, as we'll come and talk about. The typical example when this was first used was Ebola you know, Ebola vaccine that we have cared about. Mm -hmm. Then we have got the nucleic acid, which um, you know, involves the mRNA or the DNA. And then uh, the good part is that they um, induce a strong cellular immunity and they are also very easy to produce in mass. So they are the easiest to produce compared to this because you just use, you know, uh, biotechnology. The disadvantage is that they require very good storage system 
and most of the countries may not meet this. And these have been developed, uh, of course, for the first time being used in humans uh, for COVID-19. Of course, in animals, they have been uh, used before. Next slide. Okay, so just to uh, quickly talk about the live attenuated, like I said, you get a SARS-CoV-2 virus, weaken it, and then uh, make uh, the vaccine. The fact that it elicits both the immune response, both the cellular and the antibody. Next slide. So these are just graphical representation of what I was talking about. And then the other type is inactivated vaccines. The other one is live attenuated, where it's a live vaccine, but just made weak. So the problem with live attenuated is that in people with weak immunities, they can actually cause disease. For example, the children who were infected with polio, it was a live attenuated polio virus vaccine. But because some of them had weak immunity from malnutrition, they ended up developing polio. And the scandal was that uh, health workers have actually infected children with polio through the vaccine. What people just didn't understand is that those children had weakened immunity. Then when we come to the other type of vaccine uh, viruses or, or vaccines, are they inactivated? So the inactivated is not uh, live, so meaning it can be given to people with uh, weak immunities, that those with advanced HIV, cancer, and also chemotherapy. These two actually elicit both a cellular response and immune response. Next. So the next one are the viral subunits. This is where you just take part of the antigen, all right? And then you add some adjuvants and then you make a vaccine. A uh, good part is that they induce a very strong, uh, you know, antibody mediated response and a good memory. Next. Viral vector, like we said, it's where you get just part of the genetic material implant into another virus and then you inoculate. The good part is that they have got a very good uh, cellular and humor immunity as well. And mostly these are two types. They are is a replicating uh, viral vector and a non-replicating viral vector. So it all depends on what sort of um, virus you use and how you want it uh, you know, to be of once in the human body. Next. RNA vaccines is where you just get the genetic material and add adjuvants, uh, very good uh, humoral and, uh, and cellular response as well, like, like we said. Next. The next are DNA. And right now, uh, there are some which are in development. I'll talk about them, but not yet approved. So basically, it's a genetic uh, uh, material kind of uh, vaccines as well. Next. Okay, so um, as of um, approximately a month ago, there were about 121 COVID-19 vaccine candidates, which are in various developmental stages. Uh, now, out of all these 125, uh, 121, about seven uh, were in phase four and 25 were in phase three. So you can actually see that we've got more vaccines which are being developed for COVID-19 than we can imagine. Now, this is not to alarm you, and it's not really, uh, you know, strange that you have got so many vaccines being developed, because most of the vaccines actually don't make it post, you know, uh, the developmental stage, and only about thirty percent, all right, make it to the market. So you can imagine the failure rate when it comes to vaccine, and already uh, a lot of them have already failed and have been, uh, you know, abandoned through the developmental process. Next stage, next slide, sorry. So we can see um, that the different types of vaccines, so if we look at protein subunits, they are about 43. That accounts the highest number of 36% of vaccines in development are protein subunits. So you can see the viral vector, DNA, and you can see that there are even some there are even some newer type of uh, combination like, you know, virus plus antigen presenting cell, live attenuated virus, uh, you know, antigen presenting and whatever. So many combination uh, actually, which are very few. Next slide. 
Now, different doses or different viruses have got different doses. So those that are just one dose, uh, there are about 19 vaccine candidates in development. So you can imagine it's more than just the Johnson & Johnson that we know so far. Those that are two doses, there's those uh, that are given on day zero and 14 or zero and 21 and zero and 28. And there are different numbers that you can see there. Even those which are already being given as three doses. And then some of them, we don't know the data. Now, out of this, in terms of the route of administration, we've got about three, which are oral, they are still in development. The majority, 103, are actually injectable. And out of this, we've got subcutaneous, intradermal, intramuscular, and there's also intranasal, you know, where you get an intranasal spray as well. So very important, and we should be able to see these vaccines or coming on the market. It should be up to a country what we choose to have and what would be acceptable by the people. Next slide. Okay, so most vaccines, like we've said, are a two dose. So we've got, uh, you know, the, the, the priming dose and the boosting dose. So uh, they are given as two for you to actually be considered as fully immunized. And the reason for this is that they mimic the natural immune system. So the first one is where you get infection. Determine, uh, you know, uh, this type of uh, vaccine administration. So you can see that this is common with AstraZeneca and then um, and the other, you know, vaccines such as uh, Sinopharm, uh, 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 which which are two doses, including the mRNA vaccines, are two doses as well. Next. So uh, this is just showing those that are in phase three. Uh, we can go to the next slide. They're quite a lot. Okay, now. The question everybody has been asking, why should we start forcing to vaccinate everybody? Why can't we just vaccinate those who want? Now, the decision to vaccinate or the number that is needed to vaccinate is not just trimmed up, it's based on science. So let's go to the next slide and try to explore this. Okay, so this the concept of uh, herd protection or, or herd immunity. So basically, uh, this is as called different names. It can also be known as indirect protection or community immunity or community protection. And, and basically, the technical definition is the average number of secondary infections that are produced by an infected individual in an otherwise susceptible host. So this is too technical, it doesn't even make sense. But in other words, in, a, in trying to put it simply, it's the number of people in a population with immunity to a particular disease needed to protect the unvaccinated. So you need to have a specific number of people who have developed immunity for you to protect those that are unvaccinated. Next slide. So let's um, look at how is it acquired. So it's acquired in two ways, either by natural infection where people naturally get infected with that particular disease or you immunize. Now, we have to understand that eradication of disease today has only been achieved through expanded immunization programs. For example, smallpox, polio, varicella, and rubella. If you ask, you know, medical students of today, and most of us even on the call, I've never even seen any of these diseases because they are virtually, virtually eliminated from the face of the earth, all right? Now, herd immunity basically protects those people that are incapable of being vaccinated for one reason or the other, all right? Especially the newborns, you know, uh, the, the immunocompromised, the dilapidated, and all those. So we tend to protect those rather than really saying, oh, we are going to protect, you know, ourselves. And, and, and we have seen a lot of people who have refused to vaccinate, saying, I'll never, because I am fit. Vaccinations are not really for you, the fit. 
they are for the people who are susceptible. So if you think you are doing it for yourself, that's just part of the reason. The most important reason is for herd immunity and herd immunity really is for the susceptible individuals. It could be your child, it could be your niece, your grandchild, you know, your elderly mother, and, and, and maybe somebody who is immunocompromised in your family with cancer or on cancer treatment, those are the people that we are trying to protect. So next time you hear somebody saying, I'm as fit as fit, I don't need a vaccine, please try to explain to them that it's really for community based, uh, you know, benefit rather than themselves. Next slide. I like this picture, all right? So if we can see, there are four pictures here. The top left shows a buffalo with its calf. And then the top right, it shows, you know, these two big lions trying to charge at the calf and then, uh, you know, trying to defend. And once the lion actually charge, you can imagine what happens. And mostly a buffalo with a baby, it always wins and mostly wins against the lion. And you can see, the, the right bottom picture there, the calf is safe while the lions are busy battling with, you know, the bull. So this is basically what happens when it comes to herd protection. And exactly this is where the name herd, because it's a herd of cattle or buffaloes, all right? And now they are able to shoot their young. And it's the reason why this word has been used as herd immunity protection. So now let's talk about the herd immunity threshold. Next slide. So the herd immunity threshold is the proportion of individuals in a population who have acquired immunity and can no longer, uh, you know, infect others. These are called the chain breakers, all right? Now, when the number of immune individuals in the immunity or in the community is above the immune threshold, then the endemic will, you know, be eliminated, okay? Now, the Immunity threshold, which is also abbreviated as IT, it depends on the reproductive number of a disease. So the reproductive number of the disease, next slide, is just you know, the number of secondary infections one individual is actually able to produce. Let's just look in pictorial form how an immunity works in a community. So we've got the top picture there. We've seen the blue people are the healthy people, but not immunized. And then um, yellow people are the immunized and healthy, then the red are the sick and highly contagious. So if you introduce just people, the infection is introduced in a health population that is unvaccinated, all right? As these people mingle, they will infect each other with this infectious disease. And sooner or later, almost the entire community is infected, all right? Now, let's also look at if we vaccinate a few people in this population that is in the middle picture, focus on the left, then we've got a few yellow people here, it's about, you know, six, and then um, a good number of health people but not vaccinated, and then we introduce the infection. As these people mingle, you see that the people who are vaccinated will remain unaffected by the disease, but the majority of the un uh, unvaccinated will become infected. So therefore the infection is spread, right? Now let's look at the bottom picture where we vaccinate a lot of people in a population and only a few are not vaccinated. So even when they mingle, you find that the unvaccinated majority of them are shielded by these people who are chain breakers of the infection. So this highly contagious person mingles with the next person who is vaccinated, this person will get either a mouth disease or something like that, and then they are able to pass on the infection as we defined what herd immunity is. So you find that they are able to protect the unvaccinated, therefore the infection does not proceed in this community. Now, for you to determine exactly how many people should be vaccinated for you to produce this bottom picture, this is where the uh, immunity threshold comes in, and the immunity threshold depends on the which is the reproductive number. Next slide. So let's look at different uh, immunity thresholds for uh, you know um, different diseases. So if you look at mumps, they seven. 
This translates to, uh, you know, by a simple actually formula to immunity threshold of 70. If we look at the uh, diseases that are called the highest immunity threshold, like asses and measles, which is about 12 to 18, about over 90 percent immunity threshold. So meaning you need to have this number of people have immunity to a particular disease for it to stop the transmission. So you can see that the higher the R0, the higher the immunity threshold. So meaning if it's Okay, um, um, so I was talking about the um, aeronaut for COVID. Next slide. So the reproductive number for COVID is quite low. All right, so if we look at SARS-1, uh, SARS-CoV-1, it had about 3.6, which was higher than SARS-CoV-2, which is about 2.2 to 3. So meaning the immunity threshold for SARS was 72%, while for SARS-CoV-2 was about 55 to 60%. Now, this is before the variants of concern because the variants of concern have actually pushed the R0 higher. So you can see because of these figures, and that's why WHO set the standard that for a vaccine to be effective, all right, it has to beat at least the, Arab, the, the reproductive um, number for COVID, which was estimated then by at two, so meaning the, it had to beat at least 50%. So the vaccine had to be 50% efficacious or more, so that if you vaccinate a lot of people, you are going to almost arrive at this immunity threshold. So that's why you see, even when a vaccine, we already know what sort of effective or efficacy it should have based on just these numbers we are able to calculate. Next slide. Okay, so, so uh, yeah, it's this, no, next slide, next slide, next slide. So now, if you look at different scenarios, let's look at the vaccine efficacy and also vaccination rates and what would be the effect on community immunity. So if the vaccine has got a low efficacy and then you vaccinate very few people, there will be no head immunity, that disease will be prevalent in that community. If the vaccine efficacy is low and then you vaccinate almost everyone, again, head immunity won't be achieved because the efficacy of the vaccine is low. Now, let's look at if the vaccine efficacy is high. There are two scenarios uh, that are possible. You vaccinate very few people, then it means there'll be no head immunity. And this is where we are as Africa. Our vaccination rates are very low than what the R0 dictates or the immunity threshold is for COVID. So we don't expect to develop head immunity at this rate. The only way we are going to develop uh, you know, head immunity is if 
the vaccine efficacy that we have, and the efficacy is way above 50% for all of them that have been approved, and then vaccinate a very high number of people. Then we are going to see herd immunity and breaking in you know, transmission of the disease. So we've got no other option but to go for the last option, high efficacy vaccines and high vaccination rate for us to survive COVID. Next. Okay, so how basically vaccines are made? So I'll quickly talk about this. So vaccine is not one compound. The first and active ingredient is called an antigen, which is derived from uh, you know, the, the, the infection of concern. And we talked about the various antigens which are used. Then you have got preservatives that are going to ensure that uh, you know, that vaccine um, you know, doesn't lose or that antigen doesn't lose its shape. All right, or its integrity. Then we have got surfactants, we've got adjuvants, stabilizers, and residues and diluent. Now, the adjuvants are chemicals that are able to enhance the immune response. So you can imagine the difference between natural infection and the vaccine is that vaccines have got adjuvant chemicals, and these chemicals are able to enhance the body's response to that infection or to that vaccine. Whereas if you are following on natural immunity, there won't be these adjuvants which are able to have a multiplier effect on the immune response. That's one of the reasons why uh, vaccines are important and they differ from natural infection. Next slide. Okay, so two-stage process. One is the preclinical phases. The next one is the clinical. So the preclinical phase is just as important as the clinical. This is where the vaccine, first of all, is conceptualized. Then you go through computer models. Uh, next slide. We can go on next slide. And then, uh, you know, sometimes test in, in animals. So step one, you identify what's the target. This is the most important and, and very difficult, you know, uh, step in vaccine development. It's also time consuming and the most expensive, and it's the step that actually prevents most of third world countries or resource limited countries in trying to venture into vaccine production. Then step two is expression phase, all right? You find, how do we make, now that we are finding the target for this uh, vaccine, how do we make this vaccine? What is its genetic structure, all right? And, and, and what sort of target on the germ will, will be the strongest or will give the strongest immune response? So step two is equally very, very difficult and expensive. Then step three, we go to laboratory testing, where you, first of all, build mathematical models. If the mathematics and, and, and estimation is correct, then you now go to animals. Uh, and lower animals mostly. And once these animals, which are basically genetically modified to kind of have human cells as well, and this could be mice or monkeys, and then you see how they behave, then you get the idea of how this vaccine is going to behave in a human body, whether it's going to cause an immune response as you expect it to be. Next slide. Then we move to the clinical phases. The clinical phases also have got different steps, which are called phase one, phase two, and phase three, all right? They also have got a duration in which they could be conducted and the number of people that are needed. So phase one clinical trials are basically trying to see, is this drug safe, all right? And can this drug work? So we normally test it in health people. Then when we go to, next slide, when we go to phase two, okay? Next slide again. Phase two as well is asking the same question and is testing the safety of the drug. So you can see that in the clinical trials, phase one and two is basically trying to determine, is this safe? If we give it to a human, is it going to be safe? Then phase three is the only one that actually looks at efficacy. Now, next slide. In the modern, uh, you know, uh, uh, development is that, and because of availability of resources, technology, we find that we can easily combine phase two and three, especially in COVID, because we have had so many people. I'll give an example. For the past almost 40 years, all right, we have had only about 40 million people have been infected with HIV. Now, let's look at COVID. 
how long did it take us to reach 40 million people infected with COVID? Months, isn't it? We are at 241 million in just a year. To get to 40 million, it just took us months. So you can imagine that we had so many people to actually you know, be available for these clinical studies, which sometimes take time and are expensive to find the people who are actually willing to uh, participate. So out of all the does phase one, 70% of them fall off. Can you imagine? All right. Then out of those that enter, you know, um, um, oh, sorry, that proceeds to the next phase, 23 proceed to the next phase, and then only about 25 are able to come out of phase three. So you can imagine even when we have started with over 120, just be ready that only um, 20 or so who actually make it to the market for approval. Next slide. Okay, so let's look at some of the vaccines that have been approved by WHO that have been given emergency use listing. So we've got Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, and Johnson & Johnson. So the vaccine type, you know, the first two are mRNA and then um, AstraZeneca and Johnson are vector-based, all right? Dose um, overall efficacy, all right? Pfizer is about 52% after one dose and 24.6% after two doses. Uh, almost similar with Moderna, only that Moderna is highly efficacious even after the first dose at 92. When we come to AstraZeneca, it's got an efficacy of 64% after one dose, and that increases to about you know 70% um, after two doses. And when you combine different dosages, that is, if you give the low dose first and the high do uh, the, 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 the uh, standard dose later, the efficacy goes to 90%. So you can imagine that AstraZeneca is just about manipulating the dosages and also the interval of administration of the two doses. Then Johnson & Johnson uh, worked very well in the US, about 72%, and then it was lowest in South Africa at 57%, if given at day 28. Now, this is general efficacy. If we look at efficacy against severe disease, that somebody being hospitalized when they, they, they actually contract COVID, all these vaccines are highly efficacious. You can see actually Moderna and AstraZeneca giving us almost 100%. All right. If you compare to um, uh, Pfizer, which is about 90% after one dose and after two doses, virtually uh, um, Johnson and Johnson, which is just one dose and gives you about 85 after 28 days. Next slide. So similarly, these are the other type of vaccines like, like Novavax, the Russian Gamalaya, and the Chinese Sinovac and Sinopharm where we don't know where, how this perform, but we know that Gamalaya also gives you 100% of, uh, you know, for severe disease uh, after 21 days. Next slide. So this is just the efficacy of vaccines to prevent any disease at all after the second, uh, you know, um, uh, dose. So you can see that the mRNA in the boxes they are on top, and they have got the highest efficacy, and followed by Novavax, which is a protein subunit, then AstraZeneca and the Chinese follow suit there. So you can see that if we combine the viral efficacy of all of them, they are between 75 and 100 percent. They are highly efficacious. And remember, from the standard that was set by WHO in terms of what should be the manufacturer's target, it was 50 percent. So all of these are way well above the 50%. And we should know why certain vaccines are approved by WHO. It's because uh, one of the reasons is that they met the preconditions that were set before we could really know uh, how these vaccines will perform. Next slide. Okay, now let's look at vaccines efficacy against variants of consent. So the reasons why um, 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 the viruses, uh, you know, mutate, it's basically to escape the immunity, uh, including vaccine immunity. So meaning it reduces the efficacy of this vaccine. 
Now, the first variant of concern that emerged was the alpha variant, which was in the UK. So we've seen that Pfizer remains very efficacious against the alpha variant, all right? About 89% in the UK and 94% in Israel. And then if we look at um, Moderna, uh, only laboratory studies were done and no impact on neutralization. AstraZeneca against the B, uh, the alpha, sorry, reduced to about 70, and then Novavax about 86. Next slide. So let's look at the beta now, which was uh, prevalent here in South Africa and Southern Africa. So Pfizer efficacy was reduced to 75%. AstraZeneca, you can see that it was very low at 10.4%. Uh, and then Johnson & Johnson stayed afloat at about 64%. And then uh, in South Africa, about 85%. And then Novavax also dropped below 50%. So you can see that AstraZeneca and Novavax didn't do very well against the beta. Next slide, let's look at the next variant. Okay, so these are basically the studies that are, are kind of um, available. Now, these are controlled studies. Now, let's look at in the real world, given to people, real people who are not enrolled in a study, all right? Let's look at health workers. So vaccine efficacy in health workers with Pfizer gave about 86%. So basically these are MRNA, uh, mRNA vaccines. And you can see that their effectiveness in the real world was closer to the controlled conditions in the uh, trial. And uh, these were basically above 85, the lowest thing in, in Israel, but you can see that um, the highest somewhere there about 60%. So you can actually see that it was very, very efficacious. And then some of them produced signs and symptoms, others did not. Next slide. So what do we learn about vaccines from the real world? So real world evidence has shown good uh, vaccine effectiveness and then very similar to that of clinical trials. And then most vaccines remain, uh, they maintain the effectiveness even in the midst of variants of concern, although just reduced effectiveness. The not all vaccines have got the same effectiveness and the effectiveness also differ from country to country. So it also depends on how the country has rolled out that vaccine. And then the bottom line is any vaccine at this point is better than no vaccine at all because they all have got very high efficacy rates. Next slide. Okay, so this is basically showing the same, um, you know, um, the effectiveness of COVID vaccines in Israel, just taking a closer look. So you can see that um, uh, effectiveness documented infections was like 46%. Uh, reduction, then um, against symptomatic 57 hospitalizations, 74 severe disease, 64. So you can actually see that the efficacy in, you know, increased as we start looking at the disease category, all right? So preventing of infections was 92% after seven dose or, or after seven days of the second dose. Symptomatic disease reduction was 94%, and then hospitalization 82 and 92%. So you can actually see that the confidence interval actually are even reaching 100%, especially for hospitalization and severe disease. So these vaccines work, all right? And this is just an example coming from the real world data in Israel. Next slide. Okay, next we talked about this a bit, but we can uh, quickly talk about, so I talked about vaccine of viruses changing shape from time to time, and this is one of their evolutionary traits, and they do this to actually escape the immunity. And some of these, uh, you know, mutations could be advantageous to the, to the virus, or they could disadvantage the virus. Next slide. Now, if they advantage the virus, then the virus develops certain traits. Number one is they become easily transmittable. Two, they can cause very severe disease. And three, they can also reduce the effectiveness of therapeutics and vaccines. So this is an advantage to the, to the, to the uh, you know, virus. So when such a variant occurs with these characteristics, 
then we see that it's a variant of concern because it's going to worry us because more people are going to be infected, more people are likely going to have severe disease and die, and then it will mean the drugs and the vaccines that we have won't work well. So then it becomes a concern to us. That's why we call them variants of concern. Next. Okay, so I've already talked about this in terms of how it affects diagnostics, therapeutics, efficacy, disease, um, severity, and transmittability. Next. Next. So just to let you know that um, WHO has been, uh, you know, monitoring for emergence of these uh, variants of concern and variants of interest since, uh, you know, January 2020. Now, what we have to know, the difference between of concern and of interest is that the concern will have the three characteristics I talked about, whereas the, the variant of interest is one that has got certain characteristics that uh, will tell us that it could potentially cause problems, and then we keep on investigating. So it's a variant of concern that is not yet proved, and it's under investigation. It could either, after investigation, become a variant of concern, or we just forget it and we find out that it's not causing any problems. Next. So WHO, you know, there are various ways of naming the variants uh, of concern. So we've got the pangolin age, the GSAD next strain, and, and, and also uh, naming by area where it was first documented. Now, because a lot of people could not, uh, you know, uh, memorize or uh, master these scientific names, most people went for the easiest, that is to call the variant by the place where it came from. That actually resulted in certain people from certain countries being victimized, all right? So WHO had to come up with, uh, you know, nomenclature that removes the stigma by using the Greek alphabet. So it starts with alpha, beta, gamma, delta, then there's epsilon going on all the way until we reach Z, which is zeta. Next. Okay, so I think um, we spoke about this and their reduction uh, against the um, variants of concern. Next. Okay, so um, basically this is talking about the variants and now uh, it's, it's the same as the other information we have discussed. Next slide. Okay, let's talk about vaccines and safety. What are the safety concerns, all right? So issues of side effects and vaccines, we've got what are called common side effects and common side effects are mostly mild. And then we have got the rare and severe. So pain at injection site is one of those common. Then people, some people can develop fever, headache, body pains and an allergic reaction. Whereas the rare ones could be anaphylaxis and anaphylactic shock and also, uh, you know, clot formation that have been associated to these vaccines. Next slide. Now, let's look at anaphylaxis related to mRNA vaccines mostly, and also sometimes with the vector vaccines, okay? So anaphylaxis, first of all, is rare. Even in, in, in normal clinical practice, there are very few people who actually easily develop anaphylaxis, okay? Now, because this was noticed or anticipated that very few people actually developed it in clinical trials, but when we now expose a lot of people, then we started seeing um, more and more, you know, people um, having or having reported uh, anaphylaxis. So you can see that um, um, anaphylaxis reporting with um, Pfizer and Moderna, is still very low, just about 4.7 and 2.5 respectively, you know, percentage. And this is just out of 47 um, patients that were observed. And then for Moderna, it's even low of 19 patients. So you can see that it's very, very, very rare as well. And it is almost easy to predict uh, because certain people already have got underlying conditions that predisposes them to severe allergies like anaphylaxis. Next slide. The other um, side effect and safety concern issue, which was not seen in clinical trials, is the emergence of myocarditis and pericarditis after mRNA vaccines. 
Of course, it's very rare and it commonly affects males between the age of 16 and 25. So mostly it's in younger males. And then um, um, early data in terms of the outcome of those patients who developed myocarditis, the outcome has been good. And uh, you can actually see how many cases were reported to have myocarditis after the first, second, and third dose. But generally speaking, uh, the causal uh, relationship with um, mRNA is still speculative and has not been um, quite well ascertained. But for now, we'll keep it as one of the rare side effects. Next. Thrombotic events, all right, following vaccination, especially with adrenal vector vaccines, all right? So we had this, remember, it caused a lot of APRO and anxiety. It led, uh, you know, um, uh, it led certain countries suspending the vaccination program, especially with AstraZeneca. So in the UK, about 23 uh, patients were recorded to have thrombotic events between the 6 and 24. In Austria, Germany, about 11, South Africa, only five, the USA, three and 12. And the reason is because the US hasn't used much of the vector base apart from Jensen, Israel, about four, Norway, about five. But as we expose more and more people to these uh, vaccines, we have started seeing an increasing number of unusual thrombotic events that have been uh, described as in the evidence shown. Next slide. Okay, so what is TTS, which is a thrombotic thrombocytopenia syndrome, all right? So it's a rare syndrome that involves acute venous or arterial thrombosis with the onset of thrombocytopenia, especially in patients without exposure to heparin, because this phenomenon has been known to occur in patients exposed to heparin. So we don't know exactly the mechanism, but it's actually probably falling under the atypical uh, or, you know, uh, or undescribed uh, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Then it, it, it is similar, like we said, to um, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia and thrombosis in that the majority of the patients has, has got certain antibodies that are also found in heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. So um, it's important in that TSS is independent of previous exposure to heparin. Now, it makes us wonder, because of having similar antibodies, does it mean that exposure to heparin, which is also one of the crucial drugs in management of severe and critical COVID, could actually you know, see a rise in this, in this cases, especially in those who have been vaccinated? We don't know. Next slide. So signs and symptoms depends on where the thrombosis is occurring, if it's in the head, uh, severe headache is one of the symptoms, visual changes, if it's in the abdomen, abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting, could also come with back pain, shortness of breath if it's in the chest, leg pain or swelling if the clot is in the leg, uh, you know, and then petechian easy bruising with severe thrombocytopenia. Next. Diagnosis basically is that uh, somebody should have received a COVID vaccine in the past one month, especially between day four and 30. And then it could be either venous or arterial thrombosis, all right? Often in unusual locations like uh, cerebral, ven uh, cerebral sinus venous thrombosis or in the abdomen. Then thrombocytopenia should be present with platelets less than 150 to the nine count and then positive uh, platelet factor for antibodies by ELISA. So you can actually see that most uh, hospitals in Africa are unable to diagnose this, especially with regards to the last uh, you know, assay, which is not ready available in most hospitals. Next slide. Okay, so CDC on 21st June made an announcement of thrombosis with thrombocytopenia after Johnson and Johnson vaccination, and they said that it's very rare. So that actually paved way for continuous use of, um, you know, Johnson and Johnson uh, uh, in, in in the U.S. and many other jurisdictions. 
Uh, and, and you can see that Johnson & Johnson is something that is really doing wonders here in Africa, especially even with the variants of Ocean. Next. So you can see in terms of the number of cases that have been reported. So there's the total number of cases and also the rate of occurring per million. So you can see that um, this uh, actually um, very high in the 30 to 39, and that's why certain uh, you know countries are not giving uh, you know vector-based vaccines to uh, individuals below the age of 40. But if you look at your country data, and also from my country Zambia and here in Lesotho, we haven't seen much of this uh, you know thrombotic thrombos thrombosis syndrome. Uh, cases occurring actually. So you can actually judge for yourself and you find that probably the African data is different uh, compared to what we see from the European countries. Next. Okay, so management of thrombotic thrombocytopenia is please avoid heparin because it can actually worsen. The recommended treatment is intravenous immunoglobulin, and also you can use other non heparin and coagulants. All right, uh, if you don't, you are not sure that this is, um, you know, heat or heat like or TSS. So very, very important. The other things that you can use to suspect is number one, clinical symptoms, so imaging, and then uh, low platelets on full blood count. Either one of these or both of them occurring should trigger you to investigate for TSS. Next. So risk and benefits, all right. Uh, first of all, it prevents excess deaths and you know deaths as a result of severe COVID-19. All right. Uh, it also gives us a choice between uh, you know different types of vaccines, and it is important, especially here in Africa, where you know it's very difficult to get the populations for health interventions because the geographical area is vast. They are hard to reach terrains, so therefore, reaching these people once with a once one dose is actually way better than a non dose or a partial dose of just the priming rather than with the booster. Next toast, uh, next slide. Then this is looking at Chad Ox, uh, which is uh, AstraZeneca. You can actually see that for AstraZeneca, the risk of thrombosis increased with decreasing age. So in the UK, most, uh, you know, especially women below the age of 30 are not being given um, AstraZeneca, but they are being given something else. We haven't seen this data, so we cannot just blindly follow what the UK has done, all right? So you can imagine that we have to also weigh our own risk. And if we find that the risk is insignificant, then we are not going to follow those guidelines, we'll make our own. Next. So what does data from the real world, uh, you know, taught us? Vaccines are safe, very safe, actually, all right? It's safer to be vaccinated than to get infected with COVID, all right? So the rollout of these vaccines are at unprecedented speeds. And one of the reasons is because of the goodwill. The entire world is having the pandemic at the same time. So people with money were able to fund we also had a number of patients, you know, that means that we can do these clinical trials way faster than before. And as we roll out this vaccine and more and more people are coming up, you know, we are going to see a lot of side effects that probably did not come out in clinical trials because only a few patients or people were involved in that. So it is important that we continuously observe and survey for side effects. If somebody comes and complains of something after being vaccinated, please take time to look at it, document. And if it's something that is strange, please report it. Don't just keep quiet. And please don't just end on documenting, but let's discuss some of the side effects. If somebody tells you, oh, of late I'm failing to see, and they tell you I got vaccinated, you know, four days ago, even when we are not saying that the vaccine is causing insomnia, record it. Because 
there is a way in which we determine what are the new side effects that are emerging that we probably missed. So very important that we record, especially here in Africa, where you know our records and information keeping is quite weak. Let's find systems in which we have to be recording this real world data. Next slide. What are the benefits of vaccination? Eradication of diseases. Let's look at smallpox and polio. Today, they are not a problem, okay? And it's because of vaccination. Prevention of cancer, like HPV and liver disease, has been achieved you know, through the HPV vaccine and also vaccination against hepatitis B and A. And then there's also the wider society benefits. And this is where most people should understand, especially if you are facing resistance you know, from uh, you know, different sects of society. Please talk about wider society benefits, costs, all right? Because if somebody is not affected, all right, at one time or the other, they're going to need healthcare services. Now, if the healthcare service is busy fighting COVID, what time will it have? What resources will it have to fight the other diseases, accidents, you know, violence, and many other, you know, uh, diseases and conditions that we are supposed to be, uh, you know, taking care of? Psychological, you know, when you are vaccinated, it, it gives you the confidence to go on to to, to go back and you know, interact with others, work freely, go to the office, go to the movie, and go to social places because you know that the chances of you getting infected are very low. And even when you get infected, severe disease or death is less likely because you are protected. So these are some of the benefits and we need our people to understand, especially in light with protection of the people that are vulnerable because that's the concept that people have missed and they have been unable to you know, advise or to take up the vaccine because they feel it should only be for their benefit. Next slide. Misinformation. Please let's fight misinformation. As healthcare workers, we are among the culprits. You can imagine this comic was coming from, uh, actually it was uh, 1930, 1830. A hundred years later, we are still thinking that vaccines are leading us you know, to the edge of the earth. Because when smallpox vaccine was uh, created, people had the same type of myth as today. No, doctors have been paid. So you are part of the big experiment. You know, they are getting paid, you are getting jabbed. Don't get the jab. Two, no, this vaccine is going to change your DNA. It's a DNA, and you find so many people talking about it's made of DNA, so it's going to change your DNA. Your children are going to be born zombies. No, it's going to affect your, 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 you know, your fertility. All these myths just know that they have existed for over 100 years. It took over 100 years for smallpox to be eradicated. But with fighting misinformation, we can actually end COVID within our generation. And it will even give us now the impetus to fight HIV and develop a workable vaccine that shall lead to elimination of HIV and many other diseases associated with it. Next slide. Okay, so this is just showing the resources that have been used to develop, you know, uh, this presentation. Next slide. And uh, it's just, uh, you know, the credit slide. Please remember the COVID-19 protective measures. Keep a self distance from, especially if they are unvaccinated, wash your hands, cover your cough, and, and ensure that you keep well ventilated. Uh, you know, uh, uh, rooms and wear a mask at all times. So thank you very much for your time. I know we have taken longer than necessary, but because I wanted to preempt some of the questions that come with vaccine, this is the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Mupeta. This was very, very informative. <laughs> Um, I myself have surely learned a lot and it's, it comes at a time when we are trying to get more people vaccinated. So having the right information is important. So thank you so much. And then thank you to everyone who's um, still here on the call. Thank you for, for staying with us. Um, going right to the questions. Um, the first question is, is any booster vaccine better than no booster? Okay, so 
It depends on how that vaccine has been developed. Remember, I showed you there are certain vaccines, just one dose, some of them, the majority being two dose, and there are those that have got even three doses. So if the vaccine is uh, designed to have a booster, please, it's important because it will mean that the efficacy is actually increased. I'll give you an example. Polio vaccine. How many have taken our children to, uh, you know, under five clinic vaccinations? You know, for polio, uh, rotavirus and many others, they are given more than one dose. Why is it so? Because only one dose of polio vaccination protects the child only about to 85%. That is below what is actually required for head immunity threshold. Then when you give the second, it goes to about 85. The third actually protects up to about 85. The same goes for hepatitis B, which is given in series. So if it says three vaccines, take it that as a complete vaccine. Therefore, you get the maximum benefit by receiving a booster than not receiving a booster because some of the vaccines may be way below the immunity threshold uh, or the efficacy of that vaccine. Then you'll find that you don't get the protection as it is expected. Thank you so much, Doc. Um, we'll skip number two. Number two is, is more, I think, for the Ministry of Health here, and it's something that will um, develop over time. They're asking about the vaccines to be um, utilized in the next three to four months. Um, the third, I can just give uh, a general is... statement. Yes, talk. I can okay. give a general statement. The yes. vaccines that should be utilized in Botswana in the next three, four months, number one, are those that have uh, qualified uh, you know, the WHO emergency use authorization of full approval, and they should have an efficacy that is acceptable, especially above 50%. And, and those are the vaccines that we should utilize in Botswana. Definitely. So it's just yeah. Thank you. Um, and then someone wants to know if you've previously vaccinated with Sinovac, um, but would relocate abroad where Sinovac is not allowed, can you? vaccinate yeah a thorn issue so one of the mm. reasons i would not advocate for this is the simply answer is that we don't know if it's safe all right so something that we don't know we don't speculate we are scientists and until we know something what the outcome is going to be we cannot and i cannot advise people to to switch vaccines. The only switch strategy vaccines that we are sure of, if, if you receive AstraZeneca as the first dose, it is safe to receive Pfizer as a second dose, all right? Okay. Any other combination or switch is not yet advocated for because we are yet to know what would happen to you. We don't want to tell you, go and do it. Then you develop a side effects that is an, an, unheard of. We don't want that to happen. So stick to what you have been given until guidance is given when evidence is enough for switch strategies. Yes. Okay. Um, the last question is, um, what is the difference in mortality rates from COVID-19 among people who've taken different uh, vaccines? Okay. So, um, you know, first of all, let's talk about the vaccinated and vaccinated. There is overwhelming yeah. evidence, all right, that people who have taken the vaccine actually have uh, got reduced chances of mortality, all right? Uh, the data of people who died after receiving a vaccine, most of them died within seven days of receiving a vaccine. So they actually did not have full protection. And therefore, they ended up contracting COVID and they died, all right? Of course, in terms of the differences, it depends on which vaccine has been rolled out in a country more than the other. Let me give an example. If you have given more people AstraZeneca than Sinopharm, you find that those people who end up getting COVID after they have been vaccinated, before they develop full immunity, you'll see more people from the vaccine that has been used more compared to the vaccine that has been used less. So that's not really to say that one vaccine is worse than the other, but it's because of just the way the vaccines have been rolled out in country. 
However, I should mention that this data will be coming because we know we've seen some and we've compared, but the data we have now is insignificant to make meaningful conclusion to say this vaccine is worse than the other when it comes to if you get infected. Uh, but what we know at the moment is fully vaccinated individuals, actually data from many countries shows zero death compared to those who are partially vaccinated or have actually gotten COVID before seven days elapses after the vaccine. Oh, thank you very much, Doc. Um, very well answered. Um, Dr. Malink and Dr. Lebelonian, I have noted your questions and um, I'm sure Doc will answer them on the other side. But now we've uh, come to the end of the session. Thank you so much again, Dr. Mopeta, for making time to give us this very informative presentation. And thank you to everyone who's uh, been listening here, everyone who's attended here today. Um, Dr. I mean, Vusi, um, any last words for next week's um, webinar? Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Smith. Um, we have noted that we should probably go to a fortnightly schedule for our webinars. So we have not yet uh, scheduled anyone for next week. We'll probably be scheduling for the first week in November, uh, two weeks from now, I think it's November 4. Uh, we, we will let you know, you know, we'll send an email with details on what that webinar will be about. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, everyone. Again, thank you, Dr. Mupeta. Have a good evening. Thank you very much for having you, for having me, and have a blessed evening as well. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.